All right, we are live. You're live with Den of Geek. I am the resident UFO expert, Alejandro Rojas for Den of Geek. And of course, we've been doing these live streams. Uh, we started them with the news uh, that was breaking just a few weeks ago that the Navy had released some UFO videos. But of course, we got into those videos had been released for a few years. So why is the, the Navy saying they're just released? And then we had some excellent guests to talk about that. Um, military people, people who have been on the inside. I mean, you got some really good inf information people from some of the best people to get it from. Uh, however, you know, we've talked a lot about what the government is revealing as far as UFOs. And and uh, some of the people who have been revealing this information, such as Luis Elizondo, who ran that Pentagon program, they feel that that this is kind of this is disclosure. This is the UFO stuff. We're giving you guys the good stuff. However, our guest tonight feels there's a lot more to share. And uh, that's what we'll be talking about. So our guest, Bryce Zabel, he's a television and movie writer, producer. Um, he has authored a book on disclosure with a very well-known UFO researcher, Richard Dolan. And it was kind of speculation what would happen if the government disclosed that there were UFOs. Bryce has also worked uh, as a correspondent with CNN. Um, and he also was in charge of the Emmy Awards, essentially, and uh, when they had to delay that. And another thing I want to talk to him about, and I think we'll talk to him about just kind of this because it's so important right now. He also worked on a television show called Pandemic. And some of the things that were in his show uh, are coming to play right now. So we'll talk to Bryce all about all of that. So welcome, Bryce Zabel. Hey. Hello. Too bad we don't have a, a clapping, you know, <laughs> for you. To... Yeah. So how are you doing? I, I'm good, except I'm hearing... Um... I'm hearing a 10 second delay here. So I'm trying to get my. Okay. Uh, Can you hear me? Uh Oh, okay. Um, yeah, can you hear me at all? I, I'm, I, Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That seems better. Okay. No, no I'm still getting, it's repeating. I hear okay. you and then I hear it immediately afterwards um all right well i at least will you be able to answer my questions this way um let's see immediately afterwards i see um i'm hearing myself talk right, all right now. well i at least will you be able to answer my questions i'm hopeful let me figure um, out how to turn this down how about this try to disconnect and then reconnect um. <sighs> Okay. Well, he's doing that, and I'll watch him right there. This is live. Some people were asking uh, if this was live or not. It is live, and uh, so we're having some of the issues that you have with live. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bryce can give me a thumbs up if things start to work okay, and we'll bring him back on. But, you know, some of this idea, of course, there's there's Roswell, there's the idea of abductions, um, there are uh, all of these kind of different tropes out there. And uh, so that's what we'd be talking to Bryce about, because he's kind of tackling this idea that there's a lot more out there that uh, they could be sharing that they're not. In fact, he did a television show called Dark Se Dark Skies back in the 90s for NBC, and it was kind of their answer to the X-Files. And this television show, which lasted, I believe, two seasons, we'll ask him when he comes back on, it even had some of the characters from Project Blue Book, and it had a uh, very similar sort of uh, themes and information uh, as Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book was a government study of UFOs, uh, it actually was the third in three different uh, projects, beginning with Project Sign, Project Grudge, and then Project Blue Book. They ran from 1947 up until uh, 1969. In fact, the whole UFO project started because of a sighting by a pilot named Kenneth Arnold. And uh, this pilot, Kenneth Arnold, uh, his sighting got so popular in the press that it kind of spawned the U.S. Air Force 
investigation. And today's the anniversary of that sighting. So today it's Kenneth Arnold Day. So it is, you know, uh, makes sense that we're talking about UFOs today. But uh, with that project, you know, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was a consultant, it really wasn't that exciting. There wasn't a lot of conspiracy going on, Russians, um, you know, all of this Area 51, Roswell stuff. That was not part of it at all. That was all added to the television to kind of include some of these tropes that uh, have been in the, the mythos of UFO research for a long time. Um, but way before Project Blue was Bryce's television show, Dark Skies, which actually addressed all of these things directly because that was is what it was about. It was kind of this kid who was uh, an intelligent and uh, he had gotten a hold of all these secrets. And so he's trying to stay away from the bad guys. Very X-File-ish, but, you know, based on actual ideas or mythologies that are out there in the field. So let's see. I can see Bryce. Um, I could try to bring him on. But uh, let's see. How you doing, buddy? I, 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 I'm hearing two tracks of audio at the same time, and they're separated by fifty. I think I could know what it is. Yeah, you could have YouTube still open. Okay, let me try to get rid of YouTube. Yeah, because YouTube's going to be more delayed. Okay, now how about that? Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, hang on. All right. Maybe I may have done it. Now, say All anything. Right. And your can your good you? mic is working okay, now. It sounds great. I hear you right now. Damn. Okay. Can you hear me? Am I... Okay, I'm not... <laughs> okay. Um... So now you just can't hear me. Boy. Everything was just working, guys. We were we practiced this, and everything was fine. And all of a sudden, uh, so now he just can't hear me. So let's remove him, and uh, for a second, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. I I don't hear you in real time. Um, I've killed YouTube. Um, how long is the delay? Let's see. One, one thousand. Two, one thousand. Okay, Three, one, I just heard that. One, one, let's try. Let's let's. Yeah, let's I do really that. I apologize so, to everybody. Uh, this is. Uh, I don't know. I've done a lot of Zoom conferences since we went under, but here we go. Yeah. That's okay. This is going to work just fine. Right. Uh, you'll just have to answer my question uh, a few no, seconds it's, after I ask it's it. It's fine now, and I apologize to everybody. It's like no problem. pretty hectic. All right, there we go. Okay, so the first question, let's get into this. Let's touch on it real quick. So Pandemic, tell us a little bit about that project, uh, when it was, and what in that project are you seeing play out like the show right now? It's a great question. Listen, uh, about, uh, I think it was 2007, uh, I was hired with my wife to write a limited series for the Hallmark Channel. And what they really gave us was a title, Pandemic. Go find some, write something about pandemic. So we ended up writing uh, four hours of a miniseries uh, called Pandemic. And uh, it was, I guess, ordinarily successful for them. I mean, it was a big production for uh, the Hallmark folks, and, and they liked it. And it went on and won the Writers Guild Award. So Jackie and I were happy. We, we didn't really think about it for quite some time. And then the coronavirus hit and people started writing us. And we realized that it was streaming suddenly on Amazon and on YouTube, the platform you're on right now, YouTube had it up uh, as pandemic uh, colon the coronavirus movie. And it has over 10 million views right now uh, since the coronavirus hit, which is, you know, as you know, is astonishing. And so uh, what was interesting for us was that this this um, project we'd written suddenly had a new life. That doesn't happen really very often in Hollywood. Things have a life and then they die and then they stay dead. That's usually what happens. This one came back to life 
And uh, interestingly enough, there were things that we got right. Uh, we talked about uh, storing uh, dead bodies uh, in an ice rink, and Spain started doing that a few months ago. Uh, we, we, we talked about how to evacuate. A the virus in our film came over on a plane. We talked about how that worked and how they took passengers off the plane for quarantine in direct relation to where they were to patient zero. Just a lot of kind of stuff that we had in there. So it, it's come back. It doesn't make me an expert on coronavirus, uh, but, but it was interesting, I have to say. Yeah, that is really cool. That's especially, you know, getting detailed points like the ice rink. That's kind of how did you even come up with that idea? You know, we did a deep dive into research. It, it's what I do for any project I'm on. I do a kind of a deep research dive. So we started reading reports and uh, I, I'm not sure if anyone had ever talked about doing it, although I, I, I'm not sure... I can't remember whether we came up with it or found it deeply buried in a report someplace, but we did bring it to life. And in fact, in the final product, one of the characters is a young ice skater who obviously has to watch the ice skating rink where she has all her hopes and dreams for the Olympics turned into a, a, a morgue. So it's kind of intriguing that way, but mostly read. Also, we had a, a, a local infectious disease expert who was a consultant to us. And at the same time, we also uh, were deeply involved talking to the CDC about it. So I learned uh, a, a lot about viruses and how they spread. And I read several books on the 1980 uh, influenza, which uh, 1918 influenza, rather, that kind of shocked me to my bones. I was a little worried about it. I thought, boy, I really I, we've, we've come up with something that's so uh, dramatic. I just hope it never happens. And, and it's kind of happening. Yeah, who, who would have guessed? Well, I guess some people did know. Um, yeah, and some well, people didn't heed the warnings. But uh, another thing that you uh, had to tackle uh, in your career in your life was taking on the decision of what to do with the Emmys after nine eleven. Right. Uh, maybe you could talk about that because right now they're kind of struggling what to do in this crisis as well. You know, um, I ran for uh, chairman and CEO of the Television Academy. Uh, in 2001, and I uh, I got elected, um, which is its own story, but I was elected, and I was preparing to take office, and we had the Emmy scheduled on September 16th, and on September 11th, of course, 9-11 uh, happened. So suddenly, it became clear that we couldn't have the Emmys when we thought we were, and so my entire uh, beginning to uh, running the academy was to work 24 7 on how to get this right and it was i, I think probably the greatest uh, not a great it wasn't a great experience but it was the most interesting experience in my career because it was so sustained and so important uh, one of the things we immediately did is said well we've got it we may not be able to do them on september 16th but what if we try to do them on uh another date. So we picked October 7th because that worked for the network and for the academy. And on the morning of October 7th, I was lacing up my shoes to go for a run and a, the phone rings and a friend says, turn on your TV. I turned on the TV and we were invading Afghanistan. We were at war with Afghanistan. So we uh, started canvassing the people who should be coming to the Emmys and they weren't coming anymore. So we canceled them a second time on October 7th, I had a friend call me that day and say, dude, you have been on TV more than the president because it was it was just a crazy day because you had 200 cameras from all around the world there to cover the Emmys. And then the Emmys got canceled. So all they had left was me and Les Moonves from CBS uh, talking about it. Then we finally put them on on November 4th and they they happened and they were up against Game 7 of the World Series. So uh, it, it was kind of a, a tortured time with it. But I, I was on the Today Show in, in the run up to it. And uh, I, by the way, every name comes out as a Me Too victim, uh, not victim, a Me Too guy. First, Les Moonves. Now I'm going to invoke Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer asked me, um, well, what do you think about being up against the World Series? And my answer was, I'm actually pretty excited about it because it means two months after 9-11, we have two live events happening in the United States, the, the Emmy Awards and the World Series, and they're both going on as scheduled, and that made me feel pretty good. So, you know, I think mm -hmm. we got it right ultimately. So to answer your question, now the Television Academy has the same sort of problem. They're supposed to have the Emmys in September, 
And uh, it's supposed to be 6,000 people showing up and stars walking down the red carpet and everything. And I don't think anybody in their right mind thinks that's going to work. So I think we're looking at a virtual Emmys in some way, shape, or form this year, and that's probably the right decision. Mm -hmm. So getting into UFOs, uh, and there's a lot of great questions coming in, which is which is a lot of fun. And I think maybe it would be good to set this up. And here's why. I, I want to make sure that people understand your experiences in the from where you're you're coming from. And I had explained earlier while you're tinkering with your technical stuff yeah, sorry. Uh, about dark skies. No problem right. about dark skies and what that was. Um, however, you had a very strange experience where some kind of a, a man in black kind of experience. Yeah. Maybe we could start there so um, people know where you're coming from here. Yeah, um, I'm going to take these off for a minute and see if that's going to work. Um, well, what happened is uh, Dark Skies uh, aired uh, uh, in September, as shows do, and it was on NBC, and it was a huge network show. And on the night of the uh, the air, uh, when it was uh, going to air, we threw a cast uh, and crew party to sort of celebrate uh, the beginning of the series. And we held it at my house and we had like 200 people come. Everybody was on the ca you know, was on the list if you were cast or crew. And I'm going to really try to pull this together. Suffice it to say, there are a lot more details to it, but we had given everybody a little majestic badge as if they were a member of majestic 12, which was sort of a character in the, in the series. So all these people had their, their badges and they came checking in and uh, we checked them off and in the middle of the party, I get pulled over by my um, co-creator, Brent Friedman, because there's a guy in the party who basically is saying that he's been sent by people who are aware of our show, and they think we've done a pretty good job, but they want to make sure that uh, they know we know that they're available to help us get it right. That's what he put it as. This guy was like a 30-year-old in khakis and a blue you know, jacket. Um, and we were like, wait a minute, how do you know we got it right or wrong? Uh, because it hadn't aired yet, right? And he had seen it and, and he had clearly, he clearly discussed it and he knew all about it. And he did some weird things. Like he said, uh, you know, he started, uh, first of all, I was a host of a party with 200 people in my backyard. So it was kind of hard to have much of a conversation with the guy, but he, he talked about sound, light, and frequency. He wrote something on a napkin and showed it to us. And we said, what's that? And he goes, the secret of the universe. Um, and it was some like equation that looked mathematical. And at a certain point, I just said, you know, look, I gotta tell you, um, I'm not comfortable with you being in my house. Uh, someone I didn't invite to this party. I have other things to do. You should go now. And so we sort of asked him to leave. So next, uh, a few days later, um, Brent gets a call and this guy has said, well, I can see that, you know, uh, you weren't ready to talk to me, but maybe you'll talk to my boss. So this guy and another guy uh, were arranged to come out to Dark Skies. I wanted to do it under a situation where we had security and we did at the, the where we were shooting. And so this guy and his so-called boss came out. They claimed they were from the Office of Naval Intelligence, which was interesting because Majestic 12 in Dark Skies was run by O&I. Um, and he and this guy sat down. They looked taut and military. You know, they were they weren't there to make us feel good. And more than a few times, the guy that was introduced as the boss would just shake his head and act like we were the stupidest people around. And he couldn't believe he had to be there briefing people like us. And um, and I know this is going on. And again, I'm I'm pulling it in. But. I'm getting kind of freaked out and I've got a show to run at this point and it's gone on about three hours. And I said, you know, thank you for coming out, but you know, I'm not really sure that we need your help. Uh, we'll, we've been doing fine without it. And I don't think NBC wants us to be getting help from you guys, whoever you are, whether you're who you say you are or someone else. So they left. And then the, the final thing is they called my partner back up and said, listen, um, your, your partner, Bryce, seems a little, you know, hectic. He seems, a, you know, a little under the gun. But if you really want to know, we're, we're willing to take it to the next level. And the next level for these guys was that we could meet the big boss. And the big boss was supposedly on a ship in Long Beach, which was interesting. 
certainly made some sense if, from the naval angle. And uh, we said, well, where are you? And so Brent is briefing me on this phone call. He comes into my office and tells me about it. And I said, well, how would this even work? And he said, okay, this is going to be a little weird, but they want to meet us at midnight in a cemetery in Long Beach. Now, I know that sounds crazy. It sounds like, what, what is this guy smoking? Why is he making up this kind of stuff? But that's actually what they said. And that's when I said, we're done here. I got three kids. Uh, there is no way in this universe or any other multiverse where I am going to meet anybody uh, who I don't know at midnight in a cemetery. So we didn't do it. And to this day, Brent and I always joke about, well, the real series would have been what happened after we went to the cemetery. But we'll never know. And another, just because, you know, uh, also to kind of establish Brent's perspective, yeah. he also had a strange experience um, that led him to believe there's a lot more going on. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't want to completely speak for Brent because this is his story, but I will give you the bare bones of it. Brent grew up um, down the street from a guy that was in Reagan's kitchen cabinet. He was uh, the secret? He was the undersecretary of the Navy. So there's the Navy again. He was the undersecretary of the Navy in uh, Reagan's first term, and in his second term, he became Secretary of Energy. So a major guy. Brent was uh, an 18 year old kid when uh, Reagan got elected, and this uh, neighbor, uh, who was kind of a pseudo like father to Brent, asked him to drive his car across the country so that he could have it in Virginia or wherever he was living. So Brent did uh, with a friend, and um, he delivered the car, and they were having dinner, and he noticed this guy who had never had a drop of liquor in his life was drinking heavily. And uh, when dinner was over and the family was clearing off the dishes and all that, uh, this guy said, let's go outside. And um, he and Brent had a conversation where a few things were said, and, and again, uh, I may get them slightly out of order, but I remember what they were. Among them were, um, uh, he said, um, there is life in this universe, and I've seen it. And Brent said, you've seen it? And you mean like, uh, you know, he was thinking like um, Roswell or something. You know, that you saw bodies, although Roswell hadn't even been revealed at this point, and the guy said... Um, Oh, gosh, you know what? Now my memory is failing. I don't want to do, I want to do just, okay. Um, there's life in the universe and I've seen it. And then the other thing he said that, that blew Brent away was he said that he'd been briefed for uh, eight weeks at an underground facility outside of uh, uh, Washington, D.C. And he said, and I cried myself to sleep every night. And Brent said, why would you cry yourself to sleep? And he said, because I have two daughters and this is the world they're going to grow up in which is yeah. a, a pretty shattering thing. And then uh, the, to wrap this thing up in a bow, Brent said, well, okay, why are you telling me this? I'm 18 years old. And um, the guy said, well, who's going to believe you? <laughs> which I guess was true. Right. And you've touched on something that's big news as of yesterday. Uh, you've talked about the Office of Naval Intelligence, and this right. fits in with our conversation that... Just yesterday, it was revealed that the Senate Intelligence Committee, in their bill for essentially funding for intelligence, they are requesting from all intelligence agencies, uh, and, and specifically from the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force, who knew such a thing existed, or at least exactly. that title, yeah. uh, which is overseen by the Office of Naval Intelligence, this says, and they're asking for all the UFO information. I mean, my information is that this is the same group that Luis Elizondo worked for in the Pentagon, but now the office of ONI is taking it over, interestingly. Uh, but they are saying that they want to hear from all the different agencies that are in involved with this essentially UFO research group. And uh, the, the, the gist is that they're, they're concerned that they didn't know this was going on, that all this research was going on before. So I guess that brings us to disclosure. Uh, are you hopeful that uh, this will then get some more information released? And what sort of information do you think that might be? Well, let's uh, let's focus on that uh, Senate Intelligence Committee for a minute. I mean, it's mind blowing. I mean, this is Marco Rubio, uh, who is probably nobody's favorite senator, um, but 
he's the guy in charge of the committee and he's saying we want this and I, if you read the 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 bill it says we want this in 180 days which if you do the math is six months or half a year so this thing seems to be on rails to get some information in i think what it does is it raises questions about the nature of uh, how we have guarded and uh, managed the ufo information over the years um, because clearly, if the Senate is saying, we'd like to see this information in a report, that tends to mean we don't really have any more information and we want to get your information. So um, that would tell me, and, and, and that's kind of the same issue that I have with these Navy videos that the DOD has just said uh, are, are the real thing. Um, the real thing of what? We didn't get the whole uh, video. And people are talking about those videos as if, um, wow, there's these videos out. I never heard of anything. Uh, you know, that's that's a game changer. Well, they have to be in context. You know, this thing's been going on since at least 1947. Today is the day Kenneth Arnold in 1947 saw uh, those nine craft flying uh, toward him. So it, it's a big day in that regard. And, and there's a context. There's there's 70 years of this stuff. It isn't just these Navy videos. So I would think senators should know more that, than to be having to ask uh, for a report. Uh, having said that, it does strike me as whoever is managing this sort of slow rollout, or if that's what it is, uh, probably thinks that the, the way into getting the public's attention and to sort of have it take being taken credibly would be to re reveal it as a national security issue, which it certainly is. These things in the Navy videos are, are obviously interfering with uh, a carrier group. And we've also had reports of UFOs interfering with nuclear weapons for many years. So, uh, you know, I think it, it's probably appropriate they do look into it. I'm, I'm in favor of that. And I think it may be the thing that leaves the barn door open for a wider and more general disclosure. And I certainly hope so. Mm hmm. So when it comes to disclosure, you tweet a lot about disclosure and we need disclosure. We need more information um, at the same time, you know, uh, perhaps more people who are more new to this or at least that are looking at what has been revealed so far may be thinking, well, what more might there be? Um, what do you want? It seems like they've given us wow. so much. What would you? Yeah, tell us about I that. I don't think they've given us so much at all. They've made the greatest mystery in Earth's history something that we've had to try to get from people kicking and screaming over the years. And what more could there be? Well, if if you're talking about the three Navy videos and the question is what more there could be, it's like, oh, my God, let me take you to my library over there and show you the 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 hundreds of books I've I've read on this, that many of which are really well sourced. This has been going on at least since Kenneth Arnold 70, uh, 73 years ago. Um, we've, we've heard these cases. There's been photos. There's been videos. There's been many, many witnesses. There's radar. There's police witnesses, military witnesses. There's been uh, planes that have tr tracked these things, that have chased them, that have been sometimes potentially shot down by them. So it's obviously there's a ton to know. And uh, when I talk about disclosure, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be funny about it. I'm just saying, look, I'm I'm at a I'm not at the young man I used to be. I have a few more years on me and I would like to have uh, the knowledge of what at least we think is going on before I sh shuffle off this mortal coil. And, and that means we got to get moving on it. Because I don't think when we finally decide to start dribbling out some disclosure uh, about what UAP and UFOs are all about, uh, it's not like the government is going to release uh, hard drives with you know, terabytes of video and, and uh, photos on it. Uh, we're going to have to use the courts and we're going to have to have congressional hearings and there's going to have to be reports written and it's going to be a process. But I say, uh, let's get it started because it's going to be a long process and all of us together are smarter than any one of us. And that's the thing I think that has really ticked me off over the years. Here is this super, super important thing that clearly is going on. Now, I don't know that everyone, that there are people that know exactly what it all means, but they have a better theory than I do and they're not sharing it. And the U.S. citizen paid for this work. 
We paid people who went out and did this study for us. It's time for them to show us their work. It's just reasonable citizenship at this point. And yeah, you could argue, well, maybe the news is so bad you wouldn't want to hear it. Well, you know what? Maybe so, but I think it's time, 73 years later. And, and when I say all of us together are smarter than any one of us, here's what I really think it means in terms of UFO disclosure or UAP disclosure, however you want to take it. It's like currently, since we live in this official denial zone that we're in right now, that means that the people who are actually working the problem are very small in number, They, you know, because the vast, vast majority of the world doesn't think about UAP, doesn't know about UAP, and doesn't really obsess about it in any way, which means a small group is in charge of it. Well, you know, that's not how you work a problem in today's socially networked and, and uh, connected uh, world. You got to turn it loose. You turn out, you turn loose the facts and the evidence and the people themselves will take over the investigation. That's what I look forward to be happening in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of some of the scenarios that may be occurring, uh, there's a lot of talk, of course, online about crashed alien craft. Yeah. And, you know, in their defense, uh, Lou Elizondo himself, who ran that Pentagon program, told C Tucker Carlson that uh, there was, he believed there was, you know, UFO material that the government yeah. had. Um, also, some of the other people that associated with that project have said, they believe, or even were told in confidence that we do have crashed alien yeah. spacecraft, essentially. Do you think that's the case? Well, um, do I think, yes, I do think it's the case, but uh, do I think that the evidence is sufficient that, well, the rumors we've all been hearing it is somehow the New York Times is working on this story, which would certainly make sense as far as rumors go. They're the ones that broke the Navy videos uh, in, the, in the news in December of 2017. So um, we're coming up on the three-year anniversary of that. Um, it would make sense that if they were going to put that on the front page, they'd keep looking into things. And if I were them, I'd be looking into crash uh, recovery. But let's face it, a, a crash retrieval story is the holy grail of this thing. I mean, once you have a crash retrieval that's been documented and it, it's not ours and it's not the Russians and it's not the Chinese, then you have to say, well, then whose is it? And there is you can't be a little bit pregnant uh, and you can't have a little bit of disclosure. Once you acknowledge that there's a crash retrieval that actually happened, uh, you're, the, the public is going to demand more answers. Now, do I think that the New York Times is about to break this story? My judgment now would say not quite, uh, because from what I've heard, they've only been asking some of these questions for the past few weeks. So that would mean they weren't probably on a story this big ready to go. But the fact that they're starting to ask the questions, if that part of the rumor is true, is very, very good news because we need to just break this door down and that's a good way to start. Yeah, and I mean, I guess it is a legitimate question to ask right now with this recent news from yesterday, uh, coupled with the president, you know, bringing up the Roswell just a, a week or so ago. So. We'll see what happens on that front. But as far as scenarios also, uh, you talked about no matter how bad the situation would be yeah. is. Uh, and when you refer to that, do you mean um, kind of like the scenario in Dark Skies, which was these guys were coming, but they were nefarious little critters and they were ugly. <laughs> they were ugly. Um, a lot of things in Dark Skies were based on what I would consider to be true and some were metaphorical. Uh, so you know, whatever. But um, uh, here's how I would look at it. If if what was discovered in 1947 ongoing was simply that, hey, you know what? They're cuddly little alien scientists and Spielberg pretty much had it right when he did E.T. Well, that would be one thing, right? But if, in fact, they're harder to understand than that and they have potentially an agenda that is not pro-human specifically, um, even if it's benign neglect on their part, that could be troubling because you'd have to ask yourself, what justifies 73 years of extreme suppression and cover up? What what would do that if this is real, if Roswell was a real crash, if if even 
a few of these things that have been seen over the years were extraterrestrial craft of some kind or interdimensional or whatever. But if, if, if there is an underlying truth to it, you would think that it would at some point figure out how to be shared. And since it hasn't, I can only conclude that uh, somebody uh, at some point early on in this game thought this is something that is not uh, going to be accepted well by the public. So why don't we keep it to ourselves? And I think the that, that might have been a good plan in 1947, coming out of World War II and entering into the Cold War. But um, I don't think it's a good plan in 2020. So I do think uh, we need to get moving on it. I've just, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if people read Medium, but I just wrote co-wrote an article with a guy named Brian Robbins, who they may know on the Internet as UFO Jesus. But we wrote an article called We Can Handle the Truth, uh, Why Now is the Perfect Time to End the UFO Cover-Up. And, and I think that our premise there was simply to say, you know what, uh, uh, well, let me back up. I wrote a book at one point, AD After Disclosure with Richard Dolan. And one of the things we were saying is, you know, it could be pretty crazy, you know, afterwards. Uh, maybe people won't go to work. Maybe they'll stay at home. Maybe they'll riot in the streets. Well, that's happening right now. So how much worse could it be? I We think... Uh, the, the public is not only prepared to hear truth of some kind, now, understanding there will be classification of some things, but we're willing to, we're ready to hear the truth. And there's no time like the present. And there'll never be a perfect time either when you can say, well, finally, everything is calm. Now we can lay the alien thing on them. No, I say, get it. Let's get going with it. Let's get it. Let's get it done. All right, we'll go to get questions, and I've got that link I'll share in just a second to that Medium article. Um, oh, great. Thank which, you. yeah, which I know you've been talking about, which is a oh. very interesting article. But let's Alejandro, go to questions. Can I interrupt you just one thing before the question? Because Definitely. I'm talking about disclosure. I just wanted to show you something. This is a book that I was just reading. It's uh, Frank Edwards' Flying Saucer's Serious Business, right? It's from 1966. I just wanted to read you two lines he wrote. At the end of his book, he writes, the, the day of the denouement cannot be far away. The time may be shorter than we realize. My point is this. People have been predicting disclosure forever since the book's from the 50s. That book is from 66. Uh, I have a friend who predicts disclosure will be next year, and he's always wrong, except eventually one day he's going to be right. The point is um, what we need to be looking at with a clear head is, okay, are we really closer to disclosure? Are, are the planets of disclosure aligned a little better than they were before, be knowing full well that people have gotten this wrong to, uh, you know, to their frustration for many, many, many decades? And I guess by way of answering my own question, I would say I think we are a little closer. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Let's go to some questions. So here's a gentleman. He is in another country, I guess. He says it's bedtime where I'm from, uh, but they'll catch up later. Does the government have any clue on UFOs? And if so, why would they come out now? Well, I, the way I look at it is somebody must have a clue. These things have been around since the late 40s for sure. And they've done things like uh, turn off nuclear weapons and they've been chased by our airplanes. So clearly the government knows more than they've talked about because right now they're saying, yeah, we just have these three things from the, you know, the, those Navy videos. Well, what about all the other stuff? What about all the other reports they've written? So clearly the government has known more than they've chosen to share for many years. The second part of the question was why would they, why would they talk about it now? Well, <clears throat> That's always the question. Why disclose now? The cover-ups worked so great for 73 years. Let's let's keep that going. I'm sure there are people who think it is uh, the wise and prudent decision to keep keep this on the secrecy level a little while longer. But I think probably uh, what we've seen from Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon and people like that is that there are other people within government who are saying this really needs to to, to get out and be handled in the public square instead of the private square. And um, final thought to that is uh, I, I, 
I'm pretty sure the cover-up such as it was began in the U.S. military. But like many things in the military, and certainly Eisenhower warning us about the military industrial complex, I think if you were to think about who's probably managing the secret right now, it would probably involve both government and private enterprise. That's my guess. Mm -hmm. Here's a great question to follow up on that. Uh, does Bryce think U.S. presidents know the truth if uh, we have UFO tech? Some do, or some have, some haven't. Um, just a quick rundown of presidents. Um, I made an entire television series, Dark Skies, about JFK knowing and planning to tell the truth in his second term and being killed because of it. Um, I do think JFK knew, or at least had a pretty good idea. I don't think Johnson seemed to care about it. Nixon did care enough to take uh, Jackie Gleason to look at uh, some classified stuff. So I think Nixon knew about it and he was trusted as a, as a milit you know, as a friend of the military. Uh, it gets a little hinkier at that point. Then you get Gerald Ford after Nixon. Ford is the guy that called for congressional hearings when there were lots of uh, UFOs in Michigan. So I don't know whether he knew or he knew that he didn't know and wanted to know more. Then you get Jimmy Carter, who saw a UFO and said that he was going to get into office and tell us everything he could find out and then promptly said nothing. So he didn't know. Uh, then after Carter, you get to Reagan, who had two UFO sightings, started to talk about him. His own people told him, hey, you might want to not soft pedal that stuff, Ron, and let's not talk about that anymore. But he talked about aliens and how it would all bring us together. I think he knew something. I mean, he at least knew they were real, whether he the government gave him the perfect briefing, but I think they might have. Um, clearly, George Bush the first, being Central Intelligence, Reagan's vice president, I think, I think that man knew everything that there was to know and was a good soldier and kept it quiet. And that takes us to Clinton, who has always believed and been interested in UFOs and said he would get the truth. He put his guy on it for three months who came back and said, I can't get anything. I think Clinton and his wife were both frustrated. They both knew UFOs were real, but they never got the briefing, which then takes us to George Bush, the junior. I don't think he knew, which then takes us to Obama. I don't think he cared. And that takes us to Trump, who wouldn't have been briefed. So some do, some don't. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next question from Argo, and we won't be able to leave this one up because then we can't see you. <laughs> but uh, he says he's been reaching, uh, researching uh, UFOs for 37 years. He's not interested in the mundane. He wants to know about Dr. Jacobs' uh, Walking Among Us, a book you've probably read. I know you're definitely familiar with Dr. David Jacobs' yeah. work, and it certainly is not mundane. So maybe you can share. It's uh, not mundane. Who... David Jacobs has traveled um, quite a journey, hasn't he? Uh, if you look at his books um, over the years, he's gone from, you know, I have an open mind about abductions to these things are happening to where he seems to have come most recently, saying not only they're happening, there's an agenda. These uh, others have a plan. And the reason there have been abductions and people have been talking about, um, uh, you know, the medical experimentation, particularly uh, that have to do with DNA and, and uh, amniocentesis, things like that, uh, that he believes that they are creating what he calls hubrids, uh, uh, human hybrids, and that they plan to just replace us. And he's pretty strong about it. And I will say, re look, I know a lot of people dismiss everything that he said. I think he just gone off the deep end. But I know a lot of people who also say, I don't know, seems to comport somewhat with some of the evidence that we have. Um, he clearly is troubled. David Jacobs, from what I've read and seen of him talking, seems like a troubled man who feels, at least in his own mind, they're up to no good. And that would also dovetail with our previous questions, which is, why aren't they telling us? Well, I suppose if you know that there's some kind of alien replacement program going on and you haven't been able to stop it, uh, that would be a hard thing to admit to people. So, you know, that may explain a few things. Do I, what do I personally think? I, you know, it was a great idea for Dark Skies. Um, I think there is some evidence that is very disquieting on that topic. And it's possible. Yeah. 
I don't know. Al- Alondra, what do you think? Um, be so bold as to ask about me. Dr. David Jacobs yeah. and his work. I think Dr. David Jacobs is a historian and um, anecdotal information is important in that field. Yeah. Um, your colleague, Dr. Richard, or not doctor, but uh, Richard Dolan, who's yeah. very intelligent. He's a great guy. He was, he's kind of commonly known as the U- ufology's historian, right. yeah. uh, which is at times he's kind of bulk, but he's kind of gone back to appreciating that title, which is good. You know, I think yeah. he's definitely, re- but anecdotal information plays a lot higher. Um, also, I personally do have a, a degree in psychology and I have a, a, a certificate in hypnotherapy. And I feel that people's minds are too suge- suggestive. Um, and one example would be that when people go to him, to share what they believe is an alien experience, it's very negative. Um, however, when they go to other people to share them, uh, they're not. And uh, there's no doubt there's a predisposition in their mind, uh, depending on who they're going to talk to um, and the experiences that they're going to portray. So, and my problem is, is the, the disciplines that should be involved with researching this oh. uh, subject just aren't. So I think there's a lot more research that needs to go on to see if, you know, people Alejandro, are actually that is exactly what the problem is Our, you know we have the largest problem potentially ever and who's in charge of it dr david jacobs has an opinion well you know what uh i don't think there's nearly as many abductions going on as hypnosis would suggest so i think you've got something to that and also why aren't there more people you know why isn't this being studied and it's because we've told academia you can't study it or you'll be marginalized and that needs to end because I'd like to have a, a better answer to that thing. But I will say this, um, uh, one of the projects I'm working on, I have the rights to capture the Betty and Barney Hill story written by Stan Friedman and Kathy Marden. And what attracts me to that story uh, more than anything else, it's the book I always wanted to option, it's the television series I wanna make, um, is because Betty and Barney are the first. They're the first Americans to claim abduction. They're the first to experience missing time. They're the first to say, uh, to use hypnosis, to regress, to recover memories. And they're the first to describe the greys. And they couldn't base that on somebody else's story. They based it on theirs. So maybe they made it all up, according to some people. But if they did, they made it up out of their own creative minds because it wasn't given to them by somebody else's experience. So... Uh, I think that um, I think it's a great case. Um, I it it feels to me like it provides the the bedrock of saying they're at, whether whether they're happening in the numbers that people say they are now or not. They were happening, and Betty and Barney were at the beginning of that phase, whatever. And uh, they certainly had a a, a story to tell that uh, has you know uh, stood the test of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a great case. Definitely people should be educated on it, uh, whatever happened there. But, uh, and interestingly enough, you know, there are some credible, I mean, seemingly credible people with some extraordinary claims regarding alien interactions uh, yeah. or alleged alien interactions. Um, when it comes to what we've, what's been happening uh, which yeah. I think you can call disclosure because it is, yeah. you know, I think even fits your definition. So maybe yeah. you could share what your definition is. And uh, however, are you surprised, you know, having speculated about this with your book, uh, in your book with Richard Dolan, uh, what is your reaction to the public's reaction to what's going on right now? Yeah, um, I am. Uh, I, I am a little. Well, let me let me roll back on that. Um First of all, um, I'm more comfortable. I think the the public is more comfortable seeing the Navy videos where the guy is like, oh, my God, there's a whole fleet of them and it's rotating and all that because you can get your brain around that. These are F-18 fighter pilots looking and seeing something with their own eyes and reacting to it. You can get your you can really get your arms around that. The uh, the alien interaction piece of this has a lot less. uh proof in the in the in that kind of nuts and bolts area so um 
I, I think that that's been interesting. So now to talk about disclosure, there's small d disclosure, in my opinion, and big D disclosure. Small d is what we're going through right now. Uh, let me put it in Hollywood terms. Uh, in a movie, you can either have a hard cut or a slow dissolve. You know, slow dissolve is what we're in right now, and that is small d disclosure. Uh, a hard cut where you go from this to that, um, that would be big D disclosure. We are not there yet. However, if the New York Times were to put an uh, article on the front page detailing that either Roswell was real or another extraterrestrial crash was real, then we would go from small D to big D. Um, as, as Dolan and I put it, we, we called everything that we're in right now BC before confirmation and uh, what would come after AD, after disclosure. We're, we're not quite to the AD world, but we are edging out of the BC world um, right now. And, uh, and I, think, I think it's all reason to, you know, I, I don't wanna be overly optimistic. I know when I start getting optimistic, people send me messages and say, settle down. So I don't know about that, but I, I feel that there are there is a more honest discussion starting to happen right now. It's not completely honest by any stretch, and it's not definitive by any means, but it is starting. And as I said, at some point, you're going to cross the line a little bit where something has been reported or seen or whatever, where it's just pretty hard to look at it as anything other than an extraordinary piece of technology that has been deployed that's not ours and it's not uh, Russia or China's, and then we're going to have to have a, a serious discussion, which is why I'm excited about the Senate Intelligence uh, Committee request for a report, even though the report will probably be redacted and classified and not give us everything that we would like to see. But it's a start. And I'm, um, I'm heartened by the New York Times not giving up on this story, but continuing to put some resources into it. And uh, the only thing I think that kind of makes me a little nervous is um, I don't think Trump is is the best disclosure president because he's got a reputation for shading the truth to say it ch charitably. So, uh, you know, that's not exactly the right messenger for, you know, laying it out. But I, I don't know. We, we don't get to pick whoever's mm -hmm. going to be. It's like who's going to be standing when the music stops. It may be mm -hmm. him. So, um You've also, because you've examined, you know, in particular, because I, th I think the book was great. It was great where you all looked at all of these different possibilities of what may happen to all the different institutions. So far, like you said, we're seeing the slow d d dissolve um, from BC to whatever AD is. But, uh, and you mentioned the kind of the level we're at, you know, which is that there's technology that's being observed that seems to be very uh, advanced and we're looking into it. That may be where we're at for good, who knows? But the next level would be, well, the next two levels would be, level one might be the Betty Hill and, and, and Betty and Barney Hill scenario where, you know, there's an admission, okay, well, it seems like there are some legitimate experiences where people have uh, experienced interacting with, with some sort of entity. Um, that's what Close Encounters of the Third Kind was, the, the famous movie. Uh, then the next step from that might be the David Jacobs scenario, which is that not or kind of the dark sky scenarios. Not only are we interacting with them, it's really bad news. They're bad dudes. So level two, the, the Betty and Barney Hill level, what sort of things do you think we could expect from the public if we were at that level? It's it's an interesting question, and and, and I what I was flashing on while you were talking is there's a kind of a parallel. We started this uh, discussion talking about the pandemic movie that my wife and I had written back in 2007, and saying, "Well, what what did you get right? What did you get wrong?" Which is an interesting uh, thing to be able to use for analysis. And we, we got a lot right. We got human nature right more than anything in the movie, which was people will behave badly and they will do things that you tell them not to do and it will screw up things. So yeah, we got that right. And now we're kind of in the same way. Dolan and I wrote this entire book that is dedicated not to proving UFOs were real, but to talking about what would happen after we all accept that they're real, which is admittedly is not where we are yet. And so the question could be, you know, you were talking in your book about how this might uh, come to pass 
And, uh, you know, are you surprised when you got right and wrong, which is kind of how I'm starting to look at that book. I think we got tons right and still have tons right about how the various institutions, uh, whether they be education or government or um, uh, medicine or military or any of the institutions that we have are all going to get a haircut on this one and have to make some uh, changes and we'll will obviously have some issues uh, accommodating this. Um, the thing that we didn't see coming uh, was this, the whole Lou Elizondo and Tom DeLong kind of way that it would come about. It's not surprising to me. I mean, if I was an inside manager, I'd probably want to have it come out sort of like this anyway. So we are in a period where uh, we're, we're, we're getting more. And I think the longer this twilight period between BC and AD continues, the better chance we're going to have of actually dealing with it. But I think we're getting ready. I, I think people, I, I talk to people all the time. Uh, and I, 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 the people I talk to kind of fall in, I, into two places. The first kind of person is the one that says, you know, uh, I, I don't know if, if this is real, but you seem to think so. Tell me about it. They're very interested. And then there's a second type of person that says, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I believe it. Actually, there's a third kind of person, which I would put most of my family in, who all agree that I'm on the level I've, I've, I'm reporting something accurately and that these things are real, but they don't want to talk about it. So I think that's kind of the thing that we're going to get through in the next, uh, when this thing takes on a little more formality we're going to have a lot of people who are saying, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that because it is deeply disturbing. I mean, you've been going to, to, to realize that we're not alone in the universe, but we don't have to look through, uh, you know, we have to look at radio signals sent through SETI and that they report every day there's a new exoplanet discovered. But what we really should be doing is looking here on Earth for the people that have visited us. And that is the thing I think that is uh, troubling people. Mm -hmm. And I guess in a worst case scenario, um, you know, okay, there has been this idea that because how people reacted to war of the world, you know, way back when uh, they were there, they freaked out, essentially, that that's why we can't tell the public everything. Um, if we learn too much, do you think a freak out scenario is possible? Well, here's the problem. We don't know the answer to who are they? What do they want? You know, and are we safe? These are these are basic questions. So if you were to just tell me, yeah, it turned out we've been uh, visited and uh, it turns out they did some medical experiments on Betty and Barney. But generally speaking, they seem friendly and everything is great. I don't think anybody would freak out right now, but we don't know what the answers are. Somebody else knows what the answers are. So would we freak out? If the answer was, uh, let me just give you a few of them. Uh, well, they're actually us from the future, and they've come back to stop us from destroying our planet. Well, that would be deeply disorienting. That would not be something that would encourage people to go to their job at Costco in the morning, right? You go, what's the point? It's all over. If the answer was, yeah, um, it isn't just one race. There's like 57 of them, and at least 30 of them are semi-hostile or indifferent to us, and we really don't have the technology to do much about it. That would be equally disturbing. I wouldn't want to hear that. So I don't know. I, I think we are all well aware that if the news, uh, which is why I say we're going to have to work this problem as, a, as humanity. We're all going to have to come together and work it because if it's if it's reasonable news, then we'll assimilate it into our culture and we'll we'll move on. If it's bad news, we're going to do what humans do. We're going to buckle down and try to figure out how to how to carry on. I know that there is a concern um, about cultural disintegration. It's certainly something that uh, you know uh, happened to native peoples when. Uh, the Europeans arrived in the continent or when the conquistadors showed up. Those were tough times. And it's it's not impossible that we might face the same situation, that we're cruising along. At least we think we're at the top of the, uh, the top of the pile here. And then we realize, you know, you're not even in the pile. That could be tough. 
And this will have to be our last question. Oh. How do you plan on celebrating disclosure? That's a great question. Well, <laughs> again, I'm just going to refer back. Uh, it depends on what disclosure means. Um, if it's bad news, it's like everybody else. I'm probably going to be calling my friend Alejandro and saying, what are we going to do? Um, if it's good news, that's worth celebrating. I think the more likely thing is disclosure that we are going to experience first is going to be the limited modified hangout disclosure where they say, yeah, you know, it turns out that some of those actually aren't from Earth and we're studying them. Okay, if that's disclosure and that's it, then I'm not ready to celebrate. I'm ready to get to work. If that's disclosure, then I'm going to start holding people accountable. And uh, and just to give this a finish, Alondra, you asked what my definition of disclosure is. Here's what I think disclosure needs to be. It needs to be transparent. So the government and private enterprise who have been managing the secret need to be transparent about what they know, when they knew it, and what they think it means. So we need transparency. We're going to need uh, congressional hearings. And those congressional hearings are going to require that the people who are conducting the hearings um, are able to call witnesses and to use subpoenas to compel witnesses. And they're going to have to be able to offer witnesses um, immunity in order to testify. And so uh, I, rather than, I, you know, I may pour myself a drink and give myself a smile, but I'll wake up the next morning and get to work because there's a lot of work that'll be needed to be done. Mm hmm. And I guess speaking of work, uh, let us know what you're working on and where people can find your information. Oh, um, well, you know, for all your Twitter fans, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts at at Hollywood UFOs. So it's just Twitter at Hollywood UFOs. Um, but I also have a website called what if dot com. And that's kind of where I talk about these topics. Uh, what I'm working on in particular right now are a couple of things. One is a film about the last battle of World War II, which was scheduled to be shot and was uh, then postponed because of coronavirus that hopefully we're going to get back on track. And the other thing that uh, I'm passionate about, we already mentioned, which is the captured um, Betty and Barney Hill story that uh, we're looking to, uh, at one point we were going to try to make it as a feature film. And Films are all about blockbusters. If you don't have Avengers or something like that, it's it's much harder. So we're pivoting, and and because we also think uh, television provides a larger canvas, we're trying to make captured into a television series that will be ten parts for the first season, and that's our our current push forward right now. There's other things, you know. You're not a writer producer in Hollywood if you don't have ten things in your suitcase that you. Uh, uh, you know, take around, but, but that, you know, that's roughly uh, two things that are huge for us. And, um, and I, by the way, just to give you one interesting thing, I had a great idea for a cop series that we were pitching <laughs> and then, uh, you know, uh, black lives matter is an important uh, issue in our country. And it made people sort of say, I don't really know what a cop show is anymore. So we had to mm. like stop pitching that one. It was called Armed and Dangerous. And it was a great freaking idea in the pre-world. Uh, and so, you know, who knows? But I think that's what's interesting. Our world continues to change. And I've been blessed and lucky enough to be a writer and get to try to reflect that in dramatic ways. And, and I guess it's bled over in that. And now I, I start talking about the real thing, too. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. I think this has been extremely informative. So good luck on your projects going forward. And, uh, I'll, you know, I'll be watching your Twitter, but uh, it's and you're prolific on there. I mean, you're there daily sharing some thoughts and ideas. It's so. not that hard. I figured out how to be efficient at it. But I will take that. I We do. It's hard, but you just heard of, you, you know, it's the other thing I've been doing, by the way, is writing medium articles because mm. Twitter only gives you those 240 or 80 characters or whatever it is. And sometimes you want to have a little more time to make your point. Which I guess we could end on. You did write one today, too. Yes. I've got two that are really interesting. The one is the uh, We Can Handle the Truth, which I wrote with Ryan Robbins. But the one I just broke today is... Uh, 
about the Trent photos. And if you remember, no, you, nobody remembers this, but this magazine, Life magazine, in 1950, uh, all right, broke the Trent photos, right? Those Trent McMinnville photos 70 years ago. This is 70 years old. That's how long we've been doing this. And I thought, because I grew up near where the Trents lived, that it might be my turn to do a deep dive into those photos. So I've done that today. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everybody. I haven't, I haven't read it yet, but I will read it uh, as soon as we're done here, his Medium article for the day. Somebody asked, Bob McDonald said, have Bryce tell you about his Men in Black experience. We did. We started off the show with that. So you're going to have to rewind it and check it out. So really, really good stuff. Thank you so much to Bryce Dable. Uh, like he said, What If UFOs is his website. Hollywood UFOs is his Twitter. So do go check him out there. Uh, he's someone I've been talking to for years, and it's so much fun. I, I love him, and he's a great thinker, uh, always giving us different perspectives than you're going to find elsewhere. And so that's why I thought you all would really enjoy to talk to him uh, or hear from him today. So check that out. Also, so all of you that are watching, if you're on Facebook, be sure to like Den of Geeks page. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when we're doing more of these interviews. Uh, we've always got a lot of exciting stuff going on at Den of Geek. Uh, you can also follow my YouTube at Alejandro T. Rojas, just my name. And I'm also doing other live streams and lectures. In fact, later on today, I'm going to be breaking down the Pentagon UFO study and giving them all the details and my specific insight, because I have interviewed all of the major players in this on what's going on, what's going on with the news that broke yesterday. All of this I'm going to have uh, in a live stream on Crowdcast. You can also join the Open Minds TV and get that. You can find me on Patreon. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me wherever there's social media. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.